So you may have thought that oysters had enough problems ending up like this. One of the foods that you eat while they still live. But I'm here to tell you today that there are other problems affecting oysters here on the US West Coast, problems that are growing more serious as the years go by. So first, let's just think a little bit about the life of an oyster, starting perhaps as the eggs and sperm getting together, growing into a baby oyster, a larvae, which just gradually grows and grows. Juvenile settles on the bottom, where it starts to make the standard reef of oysters that you might see in the wild. Of course, to end up on your plate, like I showed you before, many times man is interfering with this cycle or encouraging it. And we collect the larvae, we collect the sperm, the eggs, the larvae, we grow them up as juveniles, and then put them out into the wild to grow up for two or three years until they're big enough to eat. Of course, if you weren't going to eat them, they could go for 20 or 30 years. But at three years, they're big enough to eat. But there are problems. The headlines you see here show you the way that the newspapers are talking about these. There's ocean acidification altering the Pacific food web. Oysters at risk. Instead of men eating oysters, oyster, ocean acidification eats oysters. And ultimately, the line that my headline came from. So what's going on? In essence, what we're seeing here is a curve I'm sure many of you have seen in newspapers and heard about. As we burn things for energy, we burn coal, we burn gasoline, we burn oil and gas. It's ending up in the atmosphere. About half of it stays in the atmosphere. Of the other half, some of that is going into the ocean. It's going into the ocean and changing the composition of the ocean. As you add that carbon dioxide to seawater, first it just dissolves. It reacts with the water. It forms hydrogen ion. Hydrogen ion is what we're really talking about when we say something is getting more acidic. The more hydrogen ion there is, the more acidic it is. But <clears throat> much of that hydrogen ion produced by that first reaction really goes on to react back, takes carbonate ion out by reacting with it. So in seawater, when the CO2 goes up, more hydrogen ion, less carbonate ion, more bicarbonate. You're changing the composition of the oceans. And this change in ocean chemistry can have an effect on the life that's living there. This headline from 2008 points out that oysters grown along the US West Coast in particular, you see people collecting shellfish there from the sands in the photograph, were having very, very poor harvests. And came to realize it was probably to do with the changing local chemical composition of the ocean where these shellfish were growing. The US West Coast has a lot of shellfish farms, many of them growing oysters, the Pacific oyster that I'm talking about here. You see them there with the large baskets of collecting. You know, these are put out, as I said, and harvested, and then brought to you in the shops. But in addition to the carbon dioxide that's dissolving in from the ocean, there's another factor here on the US West Coast, which makes it a worse system. In essence, as the winds blow along the coast, we start to get upwelling water. Those of you who have swum off San Diego will know that sometimes it's cooler than other times. When that cold water is coming up, it's bringing high nutrients. That's desirable because the nutrients are what really provide the fertilizers for the plant life growing in the ocean. And it's that plant life that ultimately the oysters themselves are eating. They're filtering seawater and living off the particles, plant life that they found in it, the phytoplankton. But it's also bringing up water that already has a high carbon dioxide level. It's water that's got this high carbon dioxide level from natural processes in the ocean, metabolizing organic material to produce carbon dioxide, but also this added carbon from our own effect on the atmosphere dissolving in. 
at two hatcheries up on the northern U.S. West Coast in Oregon and in the state of Washington, there's been a key impact of recognizing this as a problem. Now, these two hatcheries grow oyster larvae. They grow oyster larvae because you can, they're tiny. You get millions of them. You can ship them around the world to places that want to grow oysters and then set them out so that they grow to harvest size. But what they found is suddenly there were changes in just how many billions of larvae they were able to grow in a growing season. Why? What's going on? There was speculation. Maybe it was the, the temperature was wrong. Perhaps there were bacteria that were affecting these things. Finally, it became recognized that the carbon dioxide level in the water was changing life for these. So let's just think a little bit about what's happening here in these very early stages, the baby oyster, the oyster larvae. Here, after one day of an oyster larva growing under normal high CO2 but high carbonate conditions, it's growing a shell. In that early time in its life, it spends a lot of energy growing that shell. The shell is an important part of it being an oyster, and it starts early. In contrast, if you were to grow the same larvae but in high CO2 water with a lower carbonate concentration, you see already, it's smaller. It's a little more distorted. As the days go by, the one growing under the natural conditions is growing larger, the other hardly at all. Larger yet. Now, obviously, what one might almost think look of as deformities on the shell. The piece that the scientists also found is that the oysters that are deformed with a shell like this have put so much effort into even growing that much shell that they don't really live very well afterwards. Most of them die. They have a very high mortality rate in the tanks, in the hatchery, where they're doing this. And they came to recognize that this was due to the changed seawater chemistry. So that comes to the other part of my title, a canary in a coal mine, that expression on the newspaper. Canaries were used in coal mines first at the end of the 19th century. The essence was very straightforward. Mines had problems with carbon monoxide, an essentially odorless, colorless gas that kills you. If you had a canary or a mouse, they would go unconscious first. The beauty of a canary is it's actually a better sensor. Nice bright yellow color. You can really see it in the dark when it falls over. It falls over. That's another good sign, or not for the canary, perhaps. <laughs> but a mouse, less so. So miners started, as you can see in these two photographs, taking canaries in cages into the mine as a chemical sensor. Is this mine safe for me? If it's not safe for the canary, it's not going to be safe for me, but I'm going to have just enough time to get out. Look how long it was till we had a better sensor so that you could do without having canaries in mines. Now, we're going to use that picture as we think of these oyster larvae having a problem. Because oysters, if you like them, they're great. There are lots of people who go, how could you eat that? So you wouldn't care, right? But oysters are not the only sea life affected by this changing ocean composition. Coral reefs are a clear example. Coral is essentially calcium carbonate, the same thing that was growing there on the baby oyster. And as the ocean composition changes, it becomes harder for corals to grow. The pteropod, the one in the bottom left corner of that slide, shows again. There are pteropods that you can find in high CO2 waters. The shell is very flimsy, pretty well gone away. The clownfish, Nemo of fame starts to lose mental capacity. You may not have thought clownfish had a lot of mental capacity when they weren't film stars. But the experiments have shown that if you are a juvenile clownfish in a high CO2 water, you will do stupid things like go up to predators as opposed to run away from them. 
look for the wrong foods. Your sense of smell, your sense to distinguish your environment is made worse. So there's a whole variety of all these other ways that high CO2 affects a variety of ocean organisms. And we can experiment in the laboratory and see how much, but one way of saying it is that oyster larvae really was the canary that started this off. Well, they didn't just kill the canaries and throw them away. They actually had this wonderful gadget here. It's a cage for a canary where when the canary keels over, you can close the door and pump oxygen into the cage and revive the canary to use again. So it's a sustainable use sensor. Can we do that for oyster larvae? Well, they're trying. The hatcheries have this sort of panic adaptation. They, first, they ramped up research and monitoring. What's going on? What, what do we really know about the carbon dioxide in the water? Can we measure it? Do we know it's coming all the time like that or just sometimes like that? Can we move elsewhere? Well, we don't have the problems that the U.S. West Coast has. Start in Hawaii. Maybe we could just treat the water. Maybe we could chemically change how much carbon dioxide there was there and its effect by adding other chemicals to the water for when we're growing the larvae. Maybe we could have stronger oysters that weren't so susceptible in their very early life stage to the changing composition. Another hatchery just gave up. Ocean acidification refugees moved to Hawaii. Doesn't sound all bad, I suppose, except you figure out why they moved to Hawaii because their livelihood working here in the way U.S. West Coast was becoming too hard. There are prize just announced about a month ago to improve our ability to find suitable sensors to track in the oceans where this is happening, how much, to get a better scientific understanding on it. Because if we know what's going on, maybe we too could run away or change the chemistry. But it's a large problem, changing the chemistry of the ocean. But we're doing it. Perhaps we could learn to adapt. But of course, learning to adapt, all these changes, things that you may modify, isn't really ultimately the answer, is it? Because the elephant remains in the room. We're burning things for energy, which we like to use because it makes our lives better. And that is ending up in the atmosphere. And some of that is ending up in the oceans and changing it. It's changing it sufficiently quickly now that you will see headlines that say, oceans changing the fastest in 300 million years. How would you know, you may well ask. 300 million years ago, who was there to see it? Not you or I, certainly not hominids. But there are geological records that allow you to get an estimate of that. But it really doesn't matter if it has or hasn't before, happened before. It's happening now. We're changing our planet in a way that looks like we're having a problem. We've had a warning. The canaries died. Perhaps just changing where we get energy from might be a way forward. People are looking at that. I'm not really speaking to that. I, I just say thank you to my friends who helped provide pictures for me. Taylor Shellfish, who are really concerned about this. A biologist here at Oregon State who does work on understanding how oysters grow in these stressful conditions. A colleague of mine who's an oceanographer, now currently on holiday, of course, for the US government. <laughs> and of course, remember the poor canary. So the price of oysters, 350 parts per million CO2, anyone? Thank you. <laughs>